Okay, we're, we're back. We've changed our, uh, our memory card in the camera. And we were talking about the press, and you were talking about uh, the uh, kaleidoscope. Right. And kaleidoscope, uh, I, I think, was, you know, really took its cues, of course, from, uh, from oh, I'm the... I'm sorry, let, let, let's, let's start again. I, I just... Okay. I, I had to reframe you. Okay, uh, we're back. Uh, we were talking about uh, the kaleidoscope and the press. So why don't you pick that up? Kaleidoscope definitely was uh, uh, was a very artsy, very uh, graphically driven newspaper. It became a more politicized newspaper as it went on because of the situations that it found itself in. It became the voice of of the East Side uh, and uh, the contentious nature of, of, of youth culture coming up against uh, coming up against the establishment. Um, and so there were it, it became highly politicized and. Uh, there were issues about whether you know what uh, what outlets uh, allowed it to be available on on site, and uh, and there was certainly a feeling among you know some store owners that if it's in here, the cops are going to give me trouble, and there was all that going on. That was uh, definitely a factor in it. That, by way of saying that, uh, it became less this graphic uh, artistic effort to, to put out a really pretty looking newspaper. And uh, and focus on the arts and focus on uh, on poetry scene and publishing. Uh, you can't talk about the East Side at that time without talking about Morgan Gibson and Barbara Gibson. They were these critical characters uh, that uh, were both uh, teaching at UWM and very uh, very uh, driving the arts community, which was uh, a, a major part of uh, what was going on at that time. So you had. You had music on the one hand. You got Bob Reitman and uh, and the bands uh, driving the music culture. You had uh, Morgan Gibson and Barbara Gibson driving uh, arts, poetry, writing, authorship, and uh, and there were all sorts of there were many many other things, many other spokes on the wheel that uh, I'm sure other people can talk about. I those, those are the ones that I kind of uh, knew. Those are the you know my slices of uh, of the big pie that uh, that I kind of honed in on during that period. Uh, going back to radio stations just for a second, I, I, I think of this now as, I, as, as I've heard myself speak, that I really followed Bob Reitman uh, literally through his career to, to where we are this weekend with the reunion. And, and I was one of the people that said I thought that he should be with us. Uh, as uh, as a part of it, because I, I thought he was, uh, you know, one of the people that uh, really uh, set the tone for what was going on musically in town. And so, from WWM to WTOS to WZMF to uh, to WQFM, where he went, and uh, and then he was out of radio. Took a, a a break, I believe, at that point, and then ended up at WKTI, uh, which was uh, the journal station. Uh, and had a long, long career there doing morning, morning radio. He retired a number of years ago and has gone back to doing It's All Right, It's Only Music, uh, Ma, uh, on, on Thursday nights uh, back at UWM where, uh, where it all started. And uh, it was very nice that he was with us last night to introduce the bands and, uh, and, and kind of uh, close that circle that uh, for me is uh, something that uh, that uh, you know is all a part of this. Uh, uh, this is more than the 40-year journey. This would be more like the 45 or 46-year journey at that point. Uh, but uh, I thought I thought that was important. Back to newspapers. Uh, as Kaleidoscope was going through its fights over uh, over pornography and uh, access rights uh, to uh, to outlets uh, around the the east side and around, and then it expanded to all of southeastern. Wash, uh, Wisconsin, We're trying to get uh, trying to get uh, copies placed in stores uh, in uh, in you know places like Fort Atkinson and Racine and Fort Washington. It became uh, an issue every time that they they kind of moved out and into uh, bigger territories. Uh, there continued to be contention. Uh, along came a, an, an alternate publication called Bugle American, and. Uh, I don't know those people as well, except for one. The art director of uh, Bugle American was uh, was a, an American, ar a Milwaukee artist uh, named Dennis Kitchen, and Dennis uh, had a uh, a funny, quirky 
uh, style of, uh, of drawing, ca more caricature than some of the artsy, uh, graphic, uh, calligraphy uh, centric uh, type of uh, work that was being done at Kaleidoscope. Um, Bugle American had more of a, a cartoony feel to it, but it was still the same kind of issues. Uh, again, uh, the, the music scene, what was going on in town, uh, films, uh, poetry readings, uh, activities on, at UWM, activities at Marquette to some extent, and uh, had, an, uh, had a, a character called Ranger Rick, uh, kind of uh, occasionally would do Ranger Rick issues that were kind of a, maybe, maybe something of a spoof on boy's life, uh, the wholesome, wholesome kind of character in the spite of uh, the way everyone looked, which was not uh, perhaps wholesome, not in the establishment view anyway. And uh, Bugle American uh, definitely continued on for uh, much longer than uh, Kaleidoscope, had successful, uh, successful run at, uh, at covering alternate events on the east side, things that uh, the Milwaukee Journal and the Milwaukee Sentinel would not cover, uh, covering concerts, uh, you know, spending a lot of time on, uh, on the big names that came to town, uh, doing layouts for them. And you had the concert, uh, you had the concert business grow up from, from that. Back in, uh, there was some uh, mention, I think uh, Jim Solberg the other night talked about, or someone talked about uh, uh, the concerts at the scene, uh, about uh, Cream and Paul Butterfield and Jimi Hendrix playing a uh, relatively small uh, supper club, it's what, uh, what it had been for many years. Uh, there was no other outlet uh, in town for, for big concerts. And occasionally, you know, somebody like the Beatles came and Dave Clark Five played the Divine uh, Million Dollar Ballroom and, uh, and the Vogues played the Million Dollar Ballroom. The Beatles played the arena. James Brown played the arena. But these were events that uh, some of my friends went to. I never went to any of those concerts. I didn't start going to concerts until uh, I think one of the big, first big name concerts I ever went to was uh, is in Chicago with Metzger. Uh, no, it, was, it, it wasn't in Chicago, it was in, uh, we saw The Who play at the Cellar in Arlington Heights on their first tour of the United States in the summer of 66. And, uh, and then in 67, Metzger and I went down to uh, uh, Chicago to maybe the Crown Airy Ballroom, was that the name of the place? Something like that. Uh, I'm not sure, and we saw the Yardbirds. We were still both in high school. It was January of our senior year. Uh, Bob had found out that the Yardbirds were playing and, uh, and really wanted to go, and was kind of just telling me that, boy, I'd really like to go to Chicago tonight, but I have no way to get there. And my sister had just happened to mention that she was going down to, uh, to O'Hare to pick up some friends that were flying in. And uh, we twisted her arm to go a little bit early, drop us off at the concert, go do something else, pick up her friends, and then, and then she came back and picked us up. So we got to see the Yardbirds. That was, that was like, the, uh, you know, the first two major groups that I saw were, were British powerhouses. And then in Milwaukee at the scene, I saw Paul Butterfield and Cream and, and, uh, uh, and Jimi Hendrix. And those were outstanding concerts and I think all of our friends uh, or many 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 of our friends were all in in the audience that night it was uh, it was kind of the um, those were the, that was the blossoming of uh, the concert scene in Milwaukee for me it went from there to uh, to the summer of 69 a uh, big uh, Midwest rock festival at the uh, in West Dallas at the uh, state uh, state fairgrounds uh, I think that was uh, and uh, Blind Faith, Joe Cocker, uh, Bob Seeger, any number of people. The, it, it, you look at the uh, list now, Shag played the local band that was, uh, was very, very good. Um, Jim, you asked earlier about, uh, about the local bands, and I, I failed to mention Shag, and I failed to mention uh, 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 another group that, uh, um, oh, uh, Racket Squad, they were a Marquette group, uh, D.A. McDowell, and uh, uh, a number of guys that uh, that I got to know, and D.A. McDowell is still uh, still making music down in uh, down in Texas, and he's in touch with Metzger. I know, and we tried to get him to come back for this uh, this reunion weekend, but he couldn't make it. Uh, they were very good, and uh, they uh, they 
the Racket Squad morphed into the Sidewalk Skipper Band, which had a couple of hits, uh, Cynthia and something else on Capitol Records. So they, they managed to get uh, a major contract. Uh, the Brokes got a contract. Uh, a lot of uh, groups broke out for a little bit. The Robs went to, uh, through Dick Clark, uh, managed to get uh, to, uh, after Race with the Wind and, and some other things that they had uh, luck with, uh, they went to where the action is and became the house band after Paul Revere and the Raiders uh, left. And so Milwaukee always was on the cusp of, of breaking some big groups, but no one ever really set the world on fire. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have Bruce Springsteen come out of here, uh, but we had some, you know, legendary stars, uh, some of whom are involved in this uh, this weekend, but Jim Liban is uh, maybe not a household word in, uh, um, household name in uh, record collectors uh, of our era around the country, but he is if you talk to blues harmonicus. Uh, there's not a person in this country that plays blues harmonica or, or has a love of, gr of great blues harmonica that does not know him. And uh, there's the same for, for many, you know, Sam McHugh out of the Legends, uh, he's well, well known uh, in the music scene and uh, played with the Everly Brothers. So uh, that was always something that I, I know in the backs of the minds of most musicians was, you know, I'm really, I'm getting good, I'm getting better, but I don't know how to make it to the next level. Uh, and I think that was frustrating. Uh, we were so close to Chicago. We saw groups like the Shadows of Night, who we played with, and uh, who came up here and did uh, did a lot of the youth centers, uh, the Cry and Shames, uh, and uh, Little Boy Blues, and Flock, 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 yep, uh, Flock, and uh, there were there were some big big groups that uh, that made it uh, made it out and made some some big time bucks, and uh, we didn't know how to touch that. We didn't know how to how to. We were reaching for that brass ring, but we couldn't couldn't find it. So uh, I think that brings us up to uh, somewhere in the early '70s. At, uh, hey, some, any, some anything else you want to talk about while, while, while we're rolling? Um, after having, uh, I think that the love of the music is what it connected all of us for. You know, it, it was. We liked the gear in, at a certain point. We liked uh, the, being on the scene at a certain part. Uh, we liked uh, the backstage experience of uh, being in the, in the, on the inside of things. All of that was attractive, but uh, it was the music. And all these people that have come back and made the effort to be here this weekend, uh, people driving from Florida, uh, people flying in from Seattle to, to play in, in a band that they were only with for Oh, maybe uh, uh, maybe not even a year, but still having a connection to the, the, the members in that band and, and having such a, such a driving uh, uh, compulsion to, uh, to make music again with them because it, because it was a good experience the first time around and, uh, and they were willing to, uh, willing to upset their life, take, uh, take vacation time and, uh, and fly in here. I think that that's, uh, that's what it's always been for me, uh, the fact that I've dragged uh, you know, uh, 23,000 pounds worth of uh, vinyl records around the country for the last uh, 40 years uh, and, uh, and frustrated my wife with having all that junk in our living room. Uh, it's been about the music. It's, it's, I, I, it's, it speaks to me uh, and uh, it keeps expanding. You know, I thought for many years, oh, I only like rock and roll or then I only like blues and, and then uh, I start to listen to a little bit of jazz and I start to listen to a little bit of this and world music and uh, being exposed to different things. It's, it's, been, it's been one of the greatest hobbies I've, I could have possibly imagined. It's throughout my entire life, uh, knowing musicians, listening to music, finding out about music. Uh, it, uh, it just, it fired all my pistons all these, you know, all these years. It was, it was what uh, kind of drove me. It was, some guys like to go down in their basement and play with their model trains. For me, it was uh, for me it was music. Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. Thanks thank you. For